Hello friends, it's so great to be with you today. My privilege to be speaking with you today. Another warm welcome to you wherever you're joining us from around the world. Um, We're so pleased that you're here, we really are. Um, And we're continuing our journey through John's Gospel today. And so far we've been seeing Jesus really in action, following him around as he changes people's lives, as he heals the sick as bit by bit he kind of reveals a bit more of who he is and his incredible plan to save us. And we're really glad that you've joined us today as we reach the second half of John chapter 5. So why don't we grab our Bibles now um, and we'll read along from John chapter 5 and verse 16 onwards. It's John chapter 5 verse 16 onwards. It says this, So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, my father is always at his work to do, sorry, my father is always at his work to this very day and I too am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these so that you will be amazed. For just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Moreover, the father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the son, that all may honor the son just as they honor the father. Whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my words and believes them, who believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Very truly, I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge because he is the son of man. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. By myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear. And my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. When a Bible passage starts with a sentence like, so, because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, dot, 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 we know that the context or what has happened in the verses before this is really important for us understanding what is going on. And we discover by looking back briefly at the verses from last week's message that Jesus is responding to his critics. Now, you might think, what? Jesus had critics. I thought Jesus was such a lovable kind of fun-hearted kind of guy. Who would have anything to accuse him of or criticize him of? But it turns out that actually Jesus had quite a lot of people who didn't like him. A lot of people who accused him of all sorts of things. He was often accused and criticized by the group of people we see here in action in John 5. His critics here in this case are the Jewish leaders. We see that said in verse 16. Those who were responsible for teaching and upholding the Jewish law in the community. Those responsible to model to the Jewish people what following the Lord really looked like according to his law. The verses tell us that here Jesus was defending himself against their accusations or their persecutions that they were coming against him and actually now they were even seeking to kill Jesus. But what was their reason for persecuting? What was, what was it that prompted such a, an extreme response in their hearts towards Jesus? Well, John in verse 16 to 18 of chapter 5 tells us there are two reasons. 
The first reason is that the Jewish leaders claim he is doing something unlawful on the Sabbath. These leaders had understood the law of God that God had given them to keep the Sabbath day holy, to set apart a day a week where you stop working. But then they had added to it or warped it to mean something it was never meant to mean. We saw the thing that made them react like this taking place last week at the start of John chapter 5. Jesus had beautifully, wonderfully, miraculously healed a man who had been an invalid, as the text says, for 38 years. The man was healed by Jesus and had picked up his mat on the Sabbath day. And the Jewish leaders saw this as breaking the law. Jesus had not only healed this man on the Sabbath, but also instructed this man he had healed to pick up his mat, to pick up his bed that he had been sitting on. And this, for the Jewish leaders, again, was breaking the law. But they had misunderstood. They had lost sight, whether just because of forgetfulness or maybe even on purpose because something deeper was going on in their hearts. They had lost sight of the the greatest laws that God had given to love the Lord, their God, with everything that they are, but also to love their neighbor as they love themselves. God working and loving and healing and restoring didn't stop on the Sabbath day. And Jesus displays this perfectly by healing this man. But the Jewish leaders see it as law breaking. The second reason that we see they want to kill Jesus is that Jesus' words and his actions make himself equal to God. And we'll unpack this more in just a moment. But let's just first take note of how Jesus responds to this opposition. I love Jesus' response. Have you ever been there when someone says something about you or criticizes you for something that just isn't true? I get defensive. I want to say, I, I, I'm not this. No, 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 I, I, I'm not that. My response usually comes from a place of insecurity. I get worried that other people might start to believe what that person has accused me of. No, 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 don't, don't believe what they said about me. This is me, this is me, this is me. And I have a sense of needing to prove myself. I get defensive, I speak too much, and just to cover up my insecurities. I act differently maybe to make a point. Do you, do you do that too? I don't think that's just me. But that's not what's going on here. In fact, Jesus is doing something completely the opposite. It's not an insecure defense of himself. He's not got his hands up in this case and saying, oh, no, 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 don't, don't, don't believe that about me. No, he is, he is totally secure in who he is. He knows where he's come from. He knows what he is doing when he heals this man on the Sabbath. And Jesus' response, what he goes on to teach, really is him establishing for his hearers his totally secure identity. Well, what is his identity? Well, as we've already seen, he is the son of God. In 2022, we might not think that being a son is particularly groundbreaking, but what did it mean to those listening to Jesus in first century Jerusalem? Well, they clearly understood as we read this passage That by Jesus saying he was the son of God, it meant that he was equal to God. We see that in verse 18. And in their apparent spiritual blindness and lack of love for God in their hearts, these Jewish leaders could only see this as blasphemy. Some way that Jesus was contending with God or as if Jesus was claiming to be some opposing deity, kind of coming as a rival to the God of the Jewish people. Surely God wouldn't share his glory with another. In their eyes, Jesus' claim was worthy of death. But that's not at all what Jesus is meaning here. Jesus is meaning the opposite. Yes, he is equal to God. He is God. We know that from John's prologue in chapter one of his gospel. But his relationship to God the Father is not that of rivalry. Rather, as the writer Bruce Milne puts it, it is an equality expressed as a unity 
in which the Son is so utterly submitted to the Father that the two are one in the works that they do. The Son can do nothing by himself. Jesus places no limits on his dependence on the Father. In verse 19 to 20, Jesus himself says, Very truly I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his Father doing, because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. There is a oneness and an equality, but also a beautiful, loving submission. He's not coming as a rival. He's coming as an equal who also submits. And Jesus unpacks more about what this really means in the following verses. We, we see for Jesus that being God's son and equal to the father means a few things. Let's go through them together now. First, we see that he is loved. We see that in verse 20, as we've just read. Jesus the Son and God the Father exist in a relationship of the most holy and intimate mutual love. The Father proclaims over Jesus at his baptism, this is my beloved Son. We saw in John 3 verse 35 that the Father loves the Son and has placed all things into his hands. We saw in John 1 verse 18 that for eternity past, Jesus, the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in the closest relationship with the Father. Or you could translate it as in the bosom of the Father, in the embrace of the Father. There is a beautiful, loving oneness between the Father and the Son. And it leads to the Father showing the Son everything that he does. He doesn't hold anything back. The Son shares in the constant work of salvation that the Father is doing. Jesus is loved. But second, we see that out of his identity, Jesus has life to give. We see this in verse 21, but also in verse 25 to 26. And note that this is both power to give life to those who are physically dead, but also to those who are spiritually dead. We will see Jesus raising Lazarus, his friend, from physical death in John chapter 11, later in our series. Lazarus had died. But now he's walking out of the tomb. Jesus here talks about the dead also being raised when they hear his voice. But we also see throughout the Gospels that Jesus brings eternal life, new life beyond the grave to those who were once spiritually dead and separated from God, but now have new life in him. We also see that Jesus as God's son, is entrusted to judge. We see this in verse 22 and also referenced in verse 27 to 30. There is a strong theme of judgment running through these verses. Believe and follow Jesus and you will not be judged. You will receive the life that we've just mentioned. But do not believe Jesus. Live for yourself and you will be judged. You will remain under the righteous judgment of God and will be condemned. The Father entrusts that judgment to Jesus. But also Jesus judges, as he says, not to please himself, but to please the Father. It's another expression of their perfect equality, but also this submission that Jesus has towards the Father. Jesus continues in verse 23 to tell his critics that one of the results of him being entrusted with this judgment as the son by the father is that he would also receive honor from all just as the father also receives honor. In John 17 verse 10, Jesus is praying with God the father. He's speaking to God the father and says, all I have is yours and all you have is mine. There is a shared honor, a shared glorification of the Father and the Son. And in the same way, whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent the Son. The honor of the Father and the Son are totally entwined. It's totally part of who Jesus is as the Son. And finally, Jesus has authority. 
We see that in verse 27. Jesus tells the religious leaders who would want to doubt his authority that he's actually received his authority not from human rulers or any man-made systems, but from God his Father. The title Son of Man that Jesus uses of himself um, here again in verse 27 would have actually been quite a familiar phrase or a familiar title to these religious leaders. They would have known the Old Testament well. And as they hear Jesus talking about himself as the Son of Man, their minds would have instantly gone to Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 to 14. Daniel here says, I looked and there before me was one like a Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He goes on and says, this son of man was given authority, glory and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So Jesus is saying, I am that son of man. This is who I am, the one with dominion and glory and kingly power, with authority over all the nations and over all the peoples to judge. One who would rule the world and everything that we see forever and ever because my kingdom can never be destroyed. There's so much more that we could explore in these verses about Jesus' identity. But because of limited time today, I just encourage you to dive into these verses throughout this coming week. But isn't it good to be reminded of who Jesus is? He is loved and united with the Father. The one who gives life. The righteous judge. The one worthy of all honor. The one with all authority. Praise God. This is who Jesus is. But so what? (laughs) Why does this matter to me? Why does this matter to you? Well, I I believe God wants to speak to us in a couple ways today. Firstly, maybe you would see yourself in the position of the Jewish leaders. Those in this account who are resistant to Jesus. Those who don't believe that he is who he said he is. Those who would want to challenge Jesus or maybe just keep Jesus in in a box that you've kind of created for him. Or maybe even get rid of him completely. There's a, a loving warning from Jesus for you today. I urge you, don't be like these religious leaders. Listen to what Jesus says. Receive his gracious invitation to believe in him. Come to him and ask your questions. Maybe like um, Nicodemus in John chapter 3 who comes to Jesus in the middle of the night when no one else is around. So no one else can see him asking these questions. Even come to Jesus like Nicodemus. Come to him. Ask your questions. Find out for yourself who Jesus really is. Jesus promises in verse 24 that whoever, whoever hears his words and believes will be gifted eternal life and will not be judged for their sin. Did you hear that? Whoever. Not just the person who looks like they have it all together. Not just that person at work who seems to have life sorted out or that neighbor who's always chirpy and smiling. No, no. Whoever. Whoever hears his words and believes will be gifted eternal life and will not be judged for their sin. All the wrong that you have done, all the ways that you've hurt others, put yourself at the center, turn your back on God. You will not be judged guilty for any of these things if you believe in Jesus. But instead, As Jesus says in these verses, you will pass from death to life. Without Jesus, you might be physically alive, your heart might be beating, but you are spiritually dead, cut off from God. All his promises, the fullness of life that he so graciously and abundantly offers to you. But by believing in this Jesus, this good news he brings, you will receive new life, a new start, a new hope, a new future, a new identity that is totally secure and unchanging. Whether culture changes and shifts or not, your secure identity will be unchanging in Jesus. 
You will receive life in all its fullness. You will receive Jesus' perfect record. No guilt, no condemnation, no fear of death or judgment. Believe in Jesus today. But you might be hearing this and thinking, yeah, I already believe in Jesus. What? That, that doesn't apply to me. Well, it kind of does, but what's new about that? I already know that kind of stuff. Well, for you who have already believed in Jesus, in these verses, we not only see Jesus reaffirming his identity as the son, but also we see a reaffirmation of our own identity in Jesus. If we believe in Jesus, we are united with him in a deeply profound way. We are now one with him as he is one with God the Father. We were once separated from him, out on our own, no hope in this life or for the next. But if we have believed in Jesus, we are united with him in his death, but also in his resurrection to new life. We share in Jesus' sonship. We have a precious inheritance that will never fade. Everything Jesus has, we have. Jesus got his identity from the Father, so do we. We are loved in the same way by God. Did did you know that? You are God's beloved child. He speaks over you. This is my son. This is my child with whom I'm well pleased. He has placed all things into your hands. You are in the closest relationship possible with the Father. Not because you think you're getting close to him or because you kind of feel good about God today. No, you are. You are in perfect relationship with the Father, just as Jesus is. Not because of you, but because of Jesus. Because of Jesus' identity as the Son. If you share in Jesus' identity, that's what you get as well. Never to be pulled away from the Father's loving embrace. The old us is dead and gone. And we are united with Jesus in his resurrection. We have new life in Jesus. His life is our life. But also we have the life of God in us and flowing out of us. We can now bring life into dead places. Situations that feel like they're hopeless. We can bring the life of God into those places. We can bring life to those around us who are cut off from God. And also in a miracle of God's grace, we share in Jesus' honor. Wow. From rebels to royalty, from objects of wrath to reigning together with Christ, from lost and orphaned to found treasured children. We share in Jesus' honor, but also we share in his authority. We can speak to sicknesses. We can speak to evil demonic forces and spirits and take authority over them. Did you know that? We can speak as ambassadors of God's eternal kingdom. This is who you are if you have believed in Jesus. And surely this changes the way that we live. When we face critics, when we face persecution and opposition or things in culture that are just kind of bashing against us and trying to sway us this way and the next, our defense is this. I know who I am because of Jesus. I know who I am because if I'm united with Jesus, I get all that he is. I share in his identity. I know who I am because this is what God says about me. Surely it changes the way that we live. I'm just going to pray to close. Please do join me as I pray. Lord God, we just thank you for these words. We thank you for your word. Jesus, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what we see in these verses about your identity, Jesus. And... We ask you, Lord, would it change us? Would knowing who you are change who we are, Jesus, bit by bit? We thank you that you are committed to us wholeheartedly of, for transforming us more and more into the image of Jesus. 
I pray for those who haven't yet said, I believe in you, Jesus, that they, their hearts would be softened towards you and that today would be a day where they put their trust in you. They believe you. They experience this new life, this transformation. But also, Lord, for those who already know you, Lord, that you would do a deep work in our hearts of reaffirming our identity. Open our eyes to the inheritance that we have. I pray in your precious name, Lord. Amen. God bless you.